you, if you want to make the patient feel better, you can say, oh, this is just the hospital protocol. You know, before we progress things, we need to put on a mask. Just to suggest that it's not because of this tension is making you ill, but it's just the hospital protocol. So little things like this can make them feel more comfortable. All right? Now, one of the things that may help uh, is charcoal dressing. I don't know how many of you are aware of charcoal dressing. Uh, I recently found out that some of the nursing staff who are quite senior themselves are not aware of using the charcoal dressing the proper way. So I thought it would be beneficial to just mention it in the, in the presentation here. Um, another thing as well, when you're dealing with ulcers, I would strongly advise to not apply gauze directly on the ulcers. Because if you did that, every time you remove the gauze, it will only bleed. Right? And if this is happening over a lengthy period of time, the patients can lose a significant amount of blood to cause the hemoglobin to drop. And that's not good. So one of the things I advise is using a, a, a net impregnated with, um, um, with gel or, um, what do you call it, uh, Vaseline. It's marketed under the name of Bactigrass. Previously, there was something called jello net, but that's not available now. They call it Bactigrass. I always advise nursing staff to always use Bactigrass on all ulcers or wounds. Right? You want to make it easier to remove it, and you want to minimize bleeding. Now, this is how I have demonstrated charcoal dressing in one of the patients. This lady kept the ulcer at home for eight years before coming to hospital. So as you can see, she is dependent on oxygen. She's already got lung metastasis. So um, what we do is we clean the wound, and then um, I clean it. Of course, you take the swab, as I mentioned earlier, you take a swab and then you can clean it with um, either one of the materials that I mentioned, okay? And apply the Bactigrass. Is that pointer? Pointer. That's a pointer, that'd be good. But anyway, this is a Bactigrass. So it looks like a gel impregnated uh, on this net material. So put that directly on the ulcer. And on top of it, you put a piece of gumji, which is a big piece of gauze, like this. And the charcoal, depending on where, with, what your center has, it can either come in tablets or it comes in powder form. If it comes in tablets, you'll need to pound it yourself, right? And use it in powder form. So this needs to be put on the gumji, that big piece of gauze, and that can be folded over and put over the Bactigrass. All right? What I've seen some staff do is they sprinkle the charcoal directly on the wound, and that's not right. Because it, it's a sandy sort of material, okay? And once it goes into the wound, you have a rather tough time trying to flush it out. So look at pharmacy. You can pharmacy get charcoal yeah. tablets. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay. So the idea of this charcoal is basically just to remove the odor, the yeah. smell. Yes. It may not remove the smell a hundred percent, maybe fifty, sixty percent, but generally it helps. So if the wound does not smell, you don't need to put this. Right? And this may only be necessary at the first instance, maybe the first couple of weeks, until it becomes cleaner. Mm -hmm. okay? But my message is not to apply it directly on the wound. Don't sprinkle it like you would sprinkle your black pepper on your steak. So, no. Okay? Right. So, once it's completed, so you put it up nicely and just close up the wound. Okay? So that's just briefly, I thought that I want to share this with all of you, so <clears throat> you're more aware. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is one of our patients who's had a recurrence of breast cancer. As you can see, she's had surgery before. Marshall, she's presented with a recurrence 
of the swelling in the axillary area in that corner. And unfortunately, that's also caused swelling of the left upper limb, which we call lymphedema. So there is a difference in size on the left compared to the right. Another one of our patients presents to us with jaundice, as you can see. The eyes, the white of the eyes are now lemon yellow, okay? And when you examine her, in a normal person, if this is the lower rib cage, right? This is the lower rib cage of the chest wall. This is normally the limit, this yellow line, where your liver would be in a normal instance. But in this poor lady, where it's already damaged and it's added with metastases to the liver, it has enlarged to that size. Okay? So this is an enlarged liver with multiple liver uh, metastases. Her breast cancer is this about four centimeter uh, in size, but it hasn't ulcerated. Okay. Now, another way of presentation, as I mentioned, is fractures. Women, especially postmenopausal, will get thinning of the bone. That is a physiological process. But what happens is, when you have spread of the cancer to the bone, it makes the bones thinner. It eats up the bone. So just a simple slip, you can end up with fracture, and it can end up on the wheelchair. Okay? Right, um, I'll now touch a bit about investigations. <coughs> um, normally we would advise imaging of the breast um, at the time of presentation, and that will be done at the radiology department, commonly mammogram. Mammogram um, should be done for women uh, 35 years and above. It's not suitable for everybody, not for younger women. Reason being because the breast consists of a lot of uh, glandular tissue, which on um, radiograph appears white, right? So glandular tissue appears white, which is an abundance in young women. And when you do the, when they do have a growth, as in a cancer, it is also white. So white on white doesn't come out. So that's why for these women, mammography is not helpful. But as you get more mature, 35 years and above, gradually the glandular tissue in your breast will be replaced by fat, fat tissue. And fat tissue on the, the mammograph appears grayish black. So if you imagine a background of grayish black and you have a growth which is white, so white on black, then you can pick it up. Okay. And because it involves uh, radiation, we should not be doing this on pregnant women. So if you are the managing staff, it is very important before you subject these women to mammogram, you ask them when was the last menstrual period to make sure that they are not pregnant at that time. If their period was late for some reason, then you could actually propose a urine pregnancy test, have it done immediately, and maybe repeat another one in two weeks' time, just to make sure she's not pregnant. We don't really like to do a mammogram unless it's really crucial in pregnancy. You can avoid it, try and avoid it. Okay? Also in women who are currently breastfeeding, they can have changes in the breast. <coughs> um, so it would be advisable for them to undergo mammogram three months after stopping lactation or breastfeeding so that the tissues are more back to the normal uh, 
structure or makeup in order to get a more dependable report. Just as a brief uh, advice, for those who are going to undergo a mammography, um, it would be advisable not to put any talcum powder on your chest, on your underarm, no perfume, no deodorant. Reason being, the talcum powder contains talc, which can produce white little spots like salt. And this can actually mimic early breast cancer, so you don't want a false uh, reading. Okay, so this would be the advice. Perfume deodorants tend to be oily based, so they can have some impact as well, because when you have mammography, they don't only um, look at the breast, they also analyze the area in the underarm. So that is affected as well. So this would be the general advice. Resonance imaging um, that can be done on all ages. 